All right, we are live. Hello, guys. How are you doing? Uh, this is my first live stream here on YouTube. Um, I hope you guys enjoy. Today, we have a very special guest. We have Zachary Wright, um, a current member of the LDS faith living in Utah. Yeah, I think that's a, that's about right. <laughs> Welcome, Zach. Um, just so um, the viewers can get a little background on how we met, um, Zach reached out to me on Instagram, um, and he what we, we talked about the the God Maker video I made. I made this video titled um, "The Wacky World of Mormon Beliefs," um, based on this really old cartoon that has a lot of um, outdated doctrine and so probably some wrong things as well. So today we're gonna be talking about the Mormon faith, and I really appreciate that we have an active member to talk about it because I love getting every perspective and I know that every person is a different world. So, so we get to hear firsthand how, how the LDS faith works, and especially if someone f that goes to BYU, that's, that's a plus as well. <laughs> that, that must be interesting. Well, I, I, I certainly like my worldview and I certainly like all the stuff that I do. I, and I appreciate you being kind enough to, uh, I, to let me onto your, uh, to interview me and we, to let me talk to you about the sort of thing. Uh, ironically enough, you actually see this video getting passed around quite a lot. I, I think it's like about, you know, it's several decades old. I think it's more, more like upwards of like 30 or 40 years old, but the, uh, I, I'm glad that we'll get the chance to talk about it. I'm, I'm looking forward to how this is going to go and I think it'll be a good experience for us both. Yeah, for sure. And if I may ask the viewers, uh, if you have any questions, let's save them at the at the end. We're going to have a, a little Q&A and Zach is also going to ask me some questions about the Jehovah's Witnesses because uh, on the surface, they look like very similar religions. But uh, when you start looking at it, they're, they're actually quite different. Uh, so I'm sure I'm sure he wants to also delve into the world of Jehovah's Witnesses. So cool. Uh, all right, Zach, I will tell us a little bit about your life. Um, and your relationship with the church, however you want to take it. Sure. So um, I was born and raised in Utah. Uh, that's pretty much, I've, I've lived almost my entire life here. I did serve an LDS mission. For those who don't know, that's when a young you know, 18 or 19 year old um, people who are members of the church will, will take a specific set amount of time to go out and teach people about the church, try to invite people, invite people to attend, to be baptized, that sort of thing. We, we kind of give the, the general kind of rundown. Uh, it's my understanding. It's a little bit different than how the Jehovah's Witnesses do it. I'm not entirely sure how much that's, uh, that's been covered on, on, on your show. I know you did a video on kind of the differences between Jehovah's Witnesses and members of the church, but it, it, it's a little bit different in that regard. But Basically, since then, I've been attending BYU. I study psychology. I'd really like to be able to kind of do something with that eventually. But I also have a really deep passion about studying LDS theology and history and kind of talking about critical thinking skills and trying to help people, in my view, come closer to God. I'd really like to be able to do that because I think that what I believe works well for me. And I would really like other people to, to kind of do to kind of, I, I like the idea of being able to share that with other people to see if it might be helpful for them too. That's that's kind of where my head's at. But I, uh, again, Panda, I just appreciate the opportunity to be on here, and uh, hopefully, we'll be able to talk about some of the the stuff in the God Makers video. I'm not sure if we'll actually be watching it, or do, do you just want to talk about it? Did you did you have a specific uh, way you wanted to do that? Mm, well, I, I I don't have the video at the moment, but we'll direct mm -hmm. the, the viewers to it. Um, sure. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll repeat some claims made in the video and we'll see your thoughts on that as well. Uh, but yeah, I do invite everyone to go see the video if you haven't. Well, after the interview, so you can get a little look at that. Uh, oh, so so tell us um, a little bit about your mission. Where, where did you go? Uh, for viewers, you know... It's a two-year mission, I, I think, right? And for two two years for the boys, a year and a half for the girls, right? That's correct. Uh huh. Uh, so where did you go? How was your experience in your mission? So, the joke I always tell people is that I served during COVID, and so it wasn't a question of where I did go; it was a question of where I did not go because I bounced around quite a bit. The uh, I I started my mission in the Dominican Republic, and I was there for maybe about a month. 
And then COVID hit and then I got sent home. I was home for a couple months and then I got reassigned to North Carolina. And I was there for maybe about a year and then I got to go back to the Dominican Republic, which was, it was a great experience. I loved every bit of my mission. It was really helpful for me personally. Mm -hmm. But it also kind of helped prompt a couple of things that I thought were useful. It, it helped expose me to a variety of different worldviews. It helped me kind of, it kind of forced me to kind of look more deeply into what I believed and why I believed it. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I think it helped kind of, it helped me develop a more robust faith in that sense. And I, that, that's how I view it. But it was it was a really good experience because you have people all over the all over the place with kind of differing backgrounds, differing issues, and it was it was really impactful to me, at least from my point of view, to watch people that I was teaching and people I was helping and people I was engaging with, even if I had you know even if I just wasn't teaching them. What a lot of people don't understand is that missionaries will just often go and just do service even if they're not teaching people. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not like we're just outgoing and we're just teaching 24 seven as it means the end of just getting people to come to church. Uh, that is one it's, it's important to recognize that we are just, in fact, people we're actively trying to help. And while one of our most explicit purposes is to invite people to learn more about what we believe, that's certainly not the only thing that we do. And we try to be helpful wherever we can. And so having the ability just to render service in general for you know, a significant portion of my life was also really worthwhile and really meaningful. Mm, okay, wonderful. And um, I'm sure you got to learn a little bit of Spanish. Are you? Uh, I did. A Spanish speaker now. I, I'd like to say so. My uh, my job seems to really appreciate the fact I can speak Spanish. Oh, I, uh, that's great. Yeah, it, it, it's pretty good. I it's it's a skill I'd like to continue to develop and continue to maintain because I I think it's it's opened the doors for a lot of really great relationships and also just great ways I can connect with other people. So it's very good. Cool. So it, while serving your mission, um, what would you say was the most positive aspect of serving a mission and, and what was maybe a negative aspect or something, something you would uh, have improved in, or in mission, maybe something that was harsh or, you know? So naturally I served during COVID. So that was just a very difficult time for everyone it was very, very difficult for me just to have connection with people outside of like the, the kind of the missionaries that I was hanging out with because there were a lot of protocols put in place where, and I was not able to, basically I was restricted. I wasn't able to knock doors. It was, it was a very difficult time for just a lot of missionaries in general because you can, they're kind of cramped in, inside all day. You can't really connect with people or at, at the way that most missionaries, you know, for, for decades, almost centuries now, have just been able to just like go and talk to people wherever. And it, it's, um, that was a very difficult aspect. I realized just how much, I, I, I think of myself as a rather introverted person, but even I, I could begin to realize how difficult it was for a lot of people to just kind of be, be a, kind of away from both your family, but also having at least some kind of hindrance and being able just to have connections the way normal people would do anyway. But I would, I would argue that that was probably just a difficult part of COVID anyway. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm sure you, you have thoughts about that too, but one of the, again, going back to what I said before, I really loved my mission because it, it helped give me the opportunity to have a kind of emotional growth within myself. It, I, I developed lasting friendships that I am, that I still cherish to this day. I think it taught me a lot of valuable skills in both how to study and how to connect with others. And I, I, I could go, I could go on and on about individual examples of just like some of the great experiences I had, but I am, um, I, I doubt we'll have time for that. Yeah. So overall it was a positive experience for you. I, absolutely. Yeah. I would uh, 10 out of 10 would recommend so if if a uh, if a particular uh, Mormon youth has a has a negative mission experience, um, why do you think that would be? If they if they tell you like ah you know it wasn't worth it. So there are a couple of reasons that that might be the case. So for example, just from like a cultural perspective, I would I would I think it's pretty understandable that not everybody leaves on their mission serving for the for reasons that I think would be helpful. So for instance, if they leave because they feel pressured by their family, for instance, to go, 
then I imagine that they would have a more difficult time. I've met missionaries like that. Uh, so that that could that could overall contribute to feelings of kind of loneliness and feelings of immense pressure. Uh, luckily for me, I had a very supportive family and I had a I had a very deep desire for me to go. And so I can I think that that was I, I, I didn't really have that problem. Mm -hmm. But I uh, you couple that with other missionaries who may have had like a really difficult time because of things like physical illness. I had a companion who had very severe back back problems. It was very difficult for him to get around and for us to be able to like go outside and, and talk to people and do, do the things that missionaries are typically able and willing to do. And so that, that can contribute to negative experiences as well. Uh, you couple that with um, feelings of uh, mental illness is also a real thing. Like um, it's kind of this you know, depression, anxiety, uh, feelings of just disconnection in general, mm -hmm. uh, that, that can also contribute to it. So there are lots of reasons. I don't think it's just one thing per se that, yeah. that causes people to have a positive or a, neg or, or a negative experience, uh, on their mission, but it's, a. Uh, I, I think overall that most missionaries, if you ask them, even people who were members of the church and then just um, served a mission, came back, and then a little while later left, uh, you know, left left the church. I think many of them would still say that their mission was a worthwhile experience because, as I said before, it's the the entirety of that time is dedicated exclusively and explicitly to being helpful to other people. And I just think that's a good principle overall that people can embrace. And I, I think it just leads to a lot of really good relationships and skills. And I, I just can sing praises about that always till Sunday. Okay. Well, okay. That's good that you had a good experience. Um, and we, so, so every, every Mormon male is expected to, um, to serve a mission, right? It's, it's just like a rite of passage usually. Would um, that be correct? Usually, that that tends to be kind of what's talked about in general conference. I'm sure there are lo there are lots of examples where that that language is used. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it's cool because um, uh, maybe I don't know the viewers know, but um, like if if you see a Mormon Mormons preaching door to door, it's usually on a mission, right? It's um, once you're done with your mission, you don't you don't have to go to the door 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 to door. <laughs> Now that that isn't to say that mission you know, the members of the church are just supposed to never like talk about gospel stuff with other people. So, for example, I'm still really good friends with people who spent a lot of their time um, helping missionaries. Like uh, members are are encouraged and invited to assist the missionaries where it is expedient to do so, mm -hmm. and it's um, members are are likewise encouraged to help. But most of the time, you're correct in saying that. Uh, most of the time, the people doing the actual, you know, knocking on doors thing is that uh, that would be a, a set apart full time missionary. Mm, okay, yeah, because Jehovah's Witnesses, maybe you know, but it's everyone is expected to knock on doors. So <laughs> if you're a toddler or you're an old person, so that's uh, that's the main difference between Mormonism and, and Jehovah's Witnesses. You you have maybe. Yeah, not not everyone is expected to knock on doors, which is good. I, I think that's that's good because it's it's nerve wracking. I remember when I did it; <laughs> it's not easy. Yeah, it, it it certainly started out that way. Like I mentioned before, I'm kind of a reserved guy myself. I I like to read, and I'm I'm a sucker for anime and video games. But I I can sometimes have I had a difficulty for a long time just with this kind of this this social anxiety, and that was before my mission too. But I, I remember kind of getting into the hang of it and then realizing that the the more that I it, it got easier over time naturally and I remember I I remember it was always nice to have a companion with me too who could always like kind of step in and like help kind of navigate the conversation and it, it was nice to have somebody to kind of be there with you but the uh I can I, I I'm right there with you, Panda. It's the it can definitely be nerve wracking to, uh, just talk to people, in, in general, really. But yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, but uh, well, it does build character in some way. You know, it's not 
it's not something you it's not something i regret doing really for well once i leave the religion i now i see it like uh, maybe i wasted a bit too much time but uh it's something you have to experience to really understand the 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 act of proselytizing it's people don't understand how difficult it is <laughs> got it got it yeah. the uh Hold on, sorry. Give me just a second. I'm getting, I'm getting stuff here. Uh, the, yeah, I, I don't suppose there's, there's probably um, more to be said about that, but we should probably launch into the, uh, the meat of it if you're ready. Yeah, sure. Um, all right. So um, we're gonna talk about the, the some of the claims in the, in the. What's it called the God Makers video? So the God Makers video is a really old cartoon uh, made by Jeremiah Films, and oh man, I think they're they're fundamentalist Christians themselves. Um, so it it's a very anti Mormon cartoon, am I right? It's like it's designed to to ridicule. It it's designed to ridicule, and even critics of the church who are responsible know that it's not a good representation of what the church members actually believe. Mm -hmm. That's true. And, and I agree with that. And, and but we're going to talk about um, the beliefs. Um, so how in the claim that, um, let's see, what, what can we start with? Um, maybe this claim that uh, Mormons believe that um, Elohim started out as a man, right? Um, how do you how would you explain that doctrine? Is, is, it, is it a canon in, in Mormonism? that Elohim started out as a man and became a god? Uh, the short answer to that is no, it is not it's not obligatory for members of the church to believe that, no. Mm -hmm. And But was it taught by earlier church leaders? Uh, not in the way that most people think. Some church leaders did actively teach the idea that there was kind of a, that our that God, we call him Heavenly Father, had a god above him. But mm -hmm. uh, you also have to remember that uh, when the God Makers is using that term, it's not referring to uh, Elohim isn't necessarily a title. So, so, sorry, it's not necessarily God's name. Because Elohim, for example, in the biblical text is understood to be uh, just kind of the, the classification. It's just, just the word God. But that those kind of distinctions back when this thing was being taught didn't exist. And so the, when the, the way the Godmakers is using the term Elohim is not the way that members of the church would be using the term Elohim back when this idea that God the Father had a God is being taught. So there's confusion there. Mm -hmm. uh, second, it's uh, like I said before, it's not really in our scriptural canon. No one's really under an obligation to believe it. So I, I sometimes get confused why people kind of get a hang up over it. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've seen um, a little bit of the, about... Um... It, it, people ridicule this this idea a lot. The the idea that God resides in in a planet near the star Kolob, would that be official doctrine? I think it's from doctrines and covenants, right? The which is part of no, the Mormon. No, it would not be. It's not in the scriptures. It, it's not in the doctrine and covenants. No, uh, Kolob is Kolob is mentioned once in the Book of Abraham. Ah, uh, my bad. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you're good. You're good. Uh, okay, but good. the thing is, it's usually a lot of the time it's referred to as kind of a uh, metaphorical teaching. It's not really something, again, literally people are required to believe. Mm, okay. Um, and oh, man, the book of Abraham is is, is fascinating um, because it's um, how would you describe the book of Abraham <laughs> for, for our viewers that have um, no idea? <laughs> It's a so the book of Abraham. It's it's allegedly it is a text that Joseph Smith translated, and by translated it means I would I would say jo Joseph Smith used that term in a couple of different ways. I would say he brought out a deeper spiritual meaning in the text. That's that's how Joseph Smith taught the. It's, it's basically it's basically just a book of scripture that's about as as simple as one can get it. Mm -hmm. And but um, the. At least what we have remaining, the the Egyptian text that that became well, that was translated into the Book of Abraham. Um, what what I, is? I don't think it name? was. So the the text that we have right now doesn't seem to be the vast vast majority of it does not seem to be translated into the Book of Abraham. Hmm. 
Okay, good. Because what we have would be just an Egyptian funerary text, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So um, you would argue that Joseph Smith didn't translate directly from or from, from the, that text. I, I mean, it would be difficult for me to do that. We just don't have the papyri. Mm. So maybe it's a possibility that the part of the papyri was lost where Joseph Smith translated, maybe? Uh, maybe. Uh, again, okay. there's there are a couple of ways to view the word translate, so we just don't know. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, that's interesting because um, I, for our viewers, I, I mean, I, I saw the video you sent me and uh, you spoke with a Mormon apologist. I don't know if you would consider yourself a Mormon apologist. <laughs> <laughs> I. Uh, that's a good question. I've thought about that. I don't, it, it depends on the day when you ask me if I consider myself to be an apologist. Mm -hmm. I, I, some people can call me that. I just don't see the, the use of calling me that. I, I just don't, I just don't know what that proves. Yeah, true. Um, but you would consider, would you consider that you are a little more knowledgeable than average on, on apologetics? I, I, I mean, I, I'd like to say no. I mean, I, I'd like to be able to say that members of the church just understand it. But a lot of the time, I I just don't think a lot of people in their own, I, I don't think a lot of people have done, I had the experiences that I've had mm -hmm. and have studied the things that I've studied. And so me just presuming that I know more than everybody else seems, seems like the height of hubris. And I'd like to avoid it if I can, but um, maybe. I guess we'll find out tonight, won't we? Okay, yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, so that's the Book of Abraham, a very interesting text. Um, so if you could explain to our viewers um, the canon of the of the Mormon Church, just so we have this base, it, what does it consist of, uh, aside from the Book of Abraham? And tell us about the, the canon of this the, the church. So the canon, as we understand it, is the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine of Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. The Old, the Old Testament and New Testament, of course, are part of the are comprised in the biblical are there, the biblical texts. The Book of Mormon is a translated document that is that, that describes the um, events of um, ancient Israel uh, of ancient Israelites who allegedly came to America. The Doctrine and Covenants discusses the revelations that Joseph Smith himself received. Um, and then were compiled and expanded upon over time. And the Pearl of Great Price is just a collection of uh, canonized texts that were likewise uh, studied and kind of overseen by Joseph Smith. Mm, okay. So in in terms of uh, importance, all of those um, documents are, are of equal importance. Yeah. Although people might study mo some more than others, depending on circumstance. Mm, okay, um, so so the Book of Mormon is seen as, as another testament of Jesus Christ. That's the title, right? So it's it's like a, no. like a sequel. So I I wouldn't necessarily I, I see the confusion. the The answer there is more it, the, another testament of Jesus Christ is is a more recent edition. The the Book of Mormon is just the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go back to the original, you know, like the eighteen thirty edition, for instance, it doesn't say another testament of Jesus Christ. It's just the Book of Mormon. Okay. So maybe that's the, just a later tagline. Yeah. Okay. That's good. That's good. And um, a little bit on the on the the story. Well, the Book of Mormon um, talks about the um, the arrival of certain Israelite people, right, from 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 the Middle East um, to the Americas. Am I right? And, uh, yeah, it describes that in the beginning part of the narrative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, how do you reconcile? Um, that we lack genetic evidence for, for the Book of Mormon. Uh, how would you respond to the, the lack of genetic evidence? Um, there are better people to ask me about that, to ask about that. There's a lot, there's very robust um, studies into genetics in, in the Book of Mormon. I can send those to you later. You can give those out to your viewers if you wish. But the the short answer is that it's a small population and there's no reason to assume that over the, the generations and generations that their genetics would have been preserved. There's, there's of course, things like genetic drift, uh, the bottleneck effect. Uh, there's, there's no reason to assume that the genetic, the ways we have to test genetics would be able to give us accurate information about uh, 
the Nephi people, and there's no reason to assume that their genes would have survived. Mm, okay. So, well, okay. Well, thanks for putting it so simply. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so apologies. Um, that's that would be like the the main angle. Like, may the, maybe we'll, the evidence is not there because the, the genes were lost eventually, right? Well, it, it would have had to be. That's what the Book of Mormon says. Mm -hmm. The it's a small group of people that shown up that that showed up. They mixed, they intermixed with the people that were already there, mm -hmm. and their their genes just over time get lost. That's just oh. that's just the long and the short of how genetics work. Okay, and um, how would you account for the um, lack of archaeological evidence for the Book of Mormon? I would say there is archaeological evidence, but again, with less than one percent, sorry, less than one percent of Mesoamerica has been explored. We shouldn't expect to find. We, we shouldn't expect to be able to make that claim that there's no archaeological evidence. Hmm. So, you think? eventually we could find evidence that, that would corroborate the, with the Book of Mormon? Uh, I think, we, like I said, I think we already have, but mm -hmm. the the short answer is we, I I think there, there there's a case to be made there, yes. Okay. Um, and what would you interpret as, as evidence that we have right now? So there are a couple of things off the top of my head. There, there are certain Hebrew studies found within the Book of Mormon that help suggest that uh, there that, that it was an ancient document, Hebrew poetry forms, names, etc. But there's there's a um there's no again, there's a there's a there's a lot of different things. Uh, the best way to describe it is it's it's death by a thousand paper cuts, in my view, where it's not necessarily just one specific thing that mm -hmm. proves without a doubt that the the events described in the Book of Mormon are true. But if you take it, if you read the text carefully, and if you look for convergences, I would say, within what the Book of Mormon says and what the and what, what we understand about Mesoamerica in that time, I think there's a case to be made that there is certain there's evidence that the Book of Mormon is in fact an ancient document. Mm -hmm. uh, no. Uh, if your viewers want somewhere to look at that, I would recommend. Uh, give me a second here. I would recommend this book by Brant Gardner. You can hold that up here. Book of Mormon is history. Brant okay. Gardner is an excellent resource. He's one of the. He's a Mesoamerican scholar himself. You can take a look at his work. Okay, wonderful. And I mean, one one thing. Um... I, I have to give the LDS church at least some credit for is that they, they actually try to have an apologetics, um, you know, branch, right. They, they uh, because the watch tower JWs don't have any of that, <laughs> no, no apologetics whatsoever. Well, the church doesn't have an apologetic arm. Like there's no direct organization. Like these are the church apologists. There's, uh -huh. the, there's not really that per se. You, what you have is you have a bunch of people getting together and you have um, they they have their scholars of different uh, types and backgrounds and specialties and they look at this and they say hey i see this let's do some more research into it and then they find and they publish their studies in, in peer-reviewed journals and uh you'd be surprised just how much of uh You'd be just surprised. You'd be surprised how much scholarship there is actually just based, not necessarily because the church is bossing people around saying research this. It's just because people are doing independent research and they're figuring it yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. You know, you would want to find ways to strengthen your faith. You know, and and even in with independent research, it, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Um, all right, and if there's any if there's any claims you want to address as well, please let me know uh, because um, maybe I'm missing something, and I know you prepared beforehand, uh, so I don't know if there's something you want to talk about specifically. Um, specifically, no. What I really wanted to do is if I if I could walk away happy from this conversation, it would be hypothetically that everyone in your group just decides to get baptized right now. <laughs> How does that sound, viewers? No, I'm, your opinion. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm not demanding anything of anybody. But what I am saying is, is I'd like to be able to show that there are good reasons to believe what we believe. I also don't mm -hmm. think that we're justified in being called a cult, as some, as, as some of the uh, critics of the church may may seem to imply. I, if, I just, uh, what I really wanted to do is I wanted to clear up misconceptions. That's why I'm here. 
Yeah, that's great. Um, and I I think um you know when people call the LDS Church a cult, um uh man, cult is just one of those words that can be. Uh, it's just very, you know, uh, fluid. It's you, you can use it to attack others when they hold unorthodox beliefs. And I think most Christians that call the LDS Church a cult do it from that angle that that oh they don't believe in the Trinity like we do, or um, you know they they have uh, the Book of Mormon. Yeah. So I think um, I think that's an unfair way of casting a religion as a cult because their beliefs are different. Um, you know, considering that mainstream christian beliefs to an outsider can also be a bit strange you know yeah. um i mean it was understood to be a cult way back in the beginning centuries of like the common era there's there's no re I, I mean most religions if you deep down deeply enough began as cults and mm. it's it, or they would they would they would have been labeled as cults so actually this is this is a fun little tangent that i think gets to your point uh the word cult stems from the the Latin word cultoi or culter, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it it stems it, it's it stems from the, the Latin word to grow. So it's actually where we get the word agriculture or cultivate. And so when we look at it from that perspective, a cultist in the original sense just meant somebody who's trying to develop a belief in something. So a cultist for the Temple of Apollo would be someone who's trying to develop faith in the, the god Apollo. And so if you look at it from that kind of perspective, all members of just and just about any religion are, are cults in that sense. And so I, I find those kind of discussions to be meaningless, and I, I, I just think it's used as a pejorative when it's unnecessary, and I don't think it's it fosters critical thinking or good discussion to describe our mm -hmm. church or any church in that way. And that is that is true. I, I do agree with that. We have to be very be careful on, on the language we use. Um, and well, when when Jehovah's Witnesses, well, when XJWs are talking about their previous religion, another term we like to use uh, instead of cult would be high control religion. Um, would you consider that the LDS Church is a high control religion or or a high demand religion? Um, it would depend on what you mean by controlling. Mm, maybe. Well, uh, let's see. That's a that's a good question. How just because um, there's different types of control, right? Like there's information control and there's a behavioral control. Um, so we could start with the information control. Um, I think that's okay. more useful. Do you think? Do you think the the church, the LDS church, is honest in in the way it deals with its own history? Per se? Yeah. I don't think there's any reason to believe otherwise. Mm. So, like the. Uh, uh, as you were growing up in 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 your faith, um, when did you start learning about all the all the criticisms of the church, like the like the CES letter? Oh, that the well, the CES letter came out. Oh, so you you've read the CES letter? Yes. You've read the responses to it? Uh, yes. Well, good. So then you would know that from the get-go that there's there's been a lot of discussion about how a lot of the claims in the CES letter are just outrightly wrong or they're not super strong at all. Mm -hmm. or that That's my view. And I, I started learning about this stuff from a pretty young age. You might be able to make the argument that's just because my family, you know, taught me to study the scriptures and we have like, in your, we have more in-depth discussions about the history. So mm -hmm. you might be able to make that argument. But I don't see any reason to believe that the church as an organization is prohibiting its members to learn about the history, especially when they're, for example, you know, going out of their way to do things like the Joseph Smith Papers Project, where they publish every single primary source and the original documents alongside with them to you know, make it a, it's online for free. So. And would it be would it be fair to say that they did that out of a necessity to to address the 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 counter apologists, the critics? Um, I would say no, because the Joseph Smith papers started coming out before the internet and internet criticism, so to speak, became mainstream. So the Joseph Smith papers project began back in 2001, if memory serves. And they've been, you've, you've, a lot of the topics discussed in there were addressed in the magazine articles beforehand for, for decades. And so there's, again, there's, there's no reason to assume that the church is actively trying to hide these things. Mm, okay. And, um, how does the church uh, leadership um, view uh, people who leave the church? 
do they talk about them neutrally or are they critical of, of them? I, I think it depends on the person. Mm -hmm. So for, for the, the short answer though, I think by and large is no. I think that they are always recommended to people who leave the church, you're supposed to reach out and love. There's, there's no obligation to shun anybody who leaves a who leaves the church. So for example, I know people within my family who have left the church. We don't shun them. They're invited to family events. There's no reason we're not, you know, obligated to uh, treat them any differently than with uh, a genuine and sincere love. It's, but you, you, do you know cases of Mormon families uh, shunning their family members who leave? Does that happen? I hear stories of it. I couldn't necessarily verify that. Okay, but it's safe to say it, it has happened. That I, I, I live more, I'll put more... it this way. I wouldn't be surprised if it has happened. I would go after them with just as much ferocity as I hope you would. Okay, yeah. I mean, because it happens all the time with ex-JWs. We, uh, but by by now you know that it's a more extreme religion in, in some ways. I, I the, we're gonna have a couple. I have a couple of questions. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, thoughts, but... we'll, we'll have that section too. Um, and when people leave the LDS Church, um. What do you think are the main reasons for leaving? If we talk about so so, let this young person is investigating in the church. Uh, maybe he has been sheltered from different ideas because I know you're a little more open minded than um, than maybe some of the Mormons I've spoken to, which is great. But uh, let's say that a young person is not exposed to the CES letter or or any um, any critical literature, uh, critical, literature critical of this church, and then they suddenly stumble across the more problematic aspects of of the of the faith what do, what do you think are some things that that make people leave um the most or or the the things that create more problems for for the for the doubting mormon what do you say here's the problem there's not a lot of really great data to to do that because i if you have great data please let me know mm -hmm. i I, I've really done my best. There's one study that's done. There's, there's been a couple of different studies, um, but the problem is that the sample sizes have been are egregiously poor, and there's not a lot of really great data to show that. I mean, there, there are guesses that people have. Um, so, for instance, they've, they've had kind of poor, they've had poor experiences. Uh, they, you know, you mentioned that there is a possibility that they stumble across a lot of this inform. Uh, they they stumble across critical information, and they believe the reasons to disbelieve are greater than the reasons to believe. Uh, but there, um, again, there's just not a lot of really great data on that, and so I'm I'm not sure I could answer that. Besides, just give anecdotal evidence. Mm -hmm. And. I, I, I'm not. I'm not trying to dodge the question either. This is legitimately my thoughts on this. I. I really just. I, I'm not sure if there's a perfect way to read everyone's mind and ask why specifically they don't want to be a member of the church anymore. Hmm. Okay. And um, how do you personally view like uh, people that that leave the faith and well, not only leave the faith but uh, are sp speaking against the church on the internet? How How do you view these people? Like, how was his name? Um, Dr. John, the one from Mormon Stories podcast, and there's also John Delin. The John Delin, yeah, John Delin. Uh, there's there's a new girl, Alisa Greenfield, um, as well. Uh, maybe I don't know. She she's she's very new. She started on TikTok. Uh, we may even have her on the channel very soon, or I I think I might be on her channel soon. Uh, so another... I watched her videos. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, so what are your thoughts on 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 these channels that speak against the LDS Church? Um, I clap when they say things correctly, and I frown when they say things that aren't. Mm. And so, what, the, the, what, the, go, go ahead, sorry. No, no, I, I'm sorry. I, if you'd like, I can clarify which, what I mean. So, yeah. I don't view it very much as a me versus them. I really try to view it as a, they're talking about their experiences, and my experiences are different. So, for example, John DeLynn, his, his, his whole show is Mormon Stories. He tries to talk to people about their experiences. And for a long time, it was, you try to be more balanced, but more recently he's, I think he's tried to focus more on people who have had ne negative experiences with the church. But the things that he brings up are stuff that's been discussed already by, you know, scholarly academic journals and peer reviewed research. And so I, I don't find a reason to go to 
sources like TikTok or sources like YouTube podcasts when I could just go and I could do more research independently. So there's that aspect to it that I don't, that there's a part of me that finds those kinds of uh, things to not be super useful. But on the other hand, I, I can always look at their experiences and say, I can reach out with empathy and hope that there's still ways that we can find ways to connect and um, hopefully find ways to find common ground and just kind of be, find things we can agree on in terms of truth and valuing truth and trying to be the best people we can be with the knowledge we have. Mm -hmm. That's, that's good. I mean, that's a, that's a good outlook. Um, and I'm glad that you have, um, you know, that you're willing to, I don't know if you, have you ever engaged with, uh, these, uh, ex members like on a, on a live stream or, um, admittedly, no, but I've, I've talked, I've commented on their posts. I've tried to reach out to them. Like the video I sent you, for example, I've tried to respond to some of their, the allegations that they make, but, um, a lot of the time I just, they, they don't know who I am and they don't care to know who I am. And so that's that. Yeah. That's true. But, but you would be willing to do that one day if, if the opportunity came. If they invited me, I don't see any reason why I would try and turn them down. I just, I just don't think that's what they're interested in. Or I, I, if they're, if they, if they want to talk to me, please. I, I mean, they can, I just, there's also a part of me that wonders why that would, why would you talk to me? Mm -hmm. about specific historic concerns or questions about what the scriptures say when first off those things are made publicly available to anybody and also there are scholars who you know study those things for a living so i mean they can talk to me it's just a question of how, what would the purpose be how useful would it be what would our goals be and is there is there some way that we can try and um i don't necessarily want to say um Find, actually, no, they find things that we can actually agree on. Mm, that's good. Yeah, yeah, we always got to find common ground with people. But um, I do find um, at least that Mormons are more, much more open to talk with, with ex-members than, than, ex, than Jehovah's Witnesses are. <laughs> and that's, that's, a, that's a thing to commend because I've seen several videos of believing Mormons, you know, engaging in conversation with, with ex-members. And I think that's, that's a huge step forward. Uh, in at least creating healthy dialogue between the communities, because like you said, it's not us versus them, you know, um, and it's it's good. The more open the church can be for, about about um, its history and it's better the treatment. It, it's better for everyone, you know, treating each other with respect. And I think that's a positive for sure. Yeah, I I, 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 I certainly think that that's something to be commended. Yeah. Uh, is there another claim you would like to respond to about the, the God Makers video? That... <laughs> um, here, give me just a second. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of things right off the top of my head. Uh, there's no reason to assume that the savior wasn't stated by like a vote. Uh, okay. the, the scriptures themselves make no indication of that. It's like the, the scriptures in fact state the exact opposite. It says Jesus was chosen from the beginning. So there's, there's no reason to believe that, you know, it was just like Satan stood up and made his bid and then everyone decided to vote. No, that, that that's not really kind of how it's described within the, the text themselves. And I don't think I have to defend something that's not in the text itself or talk about something that's not the text itself. It would, it would enter the realm of assumption and conjecture. I try to avoid that whenever that's possible. Uh, so th there's that. Um, additionally, it talks a lot about many goddess wives. We, we don't believe God the Father has multiple goddess wives. There's just no reason for that. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's, that's inaccurate in the video. And so that's... Uh, That, that's a, that's another thing that that's just not explicated. Well, actually, hold on, let me correct that. So it is explicated in one specific document that was actually condemned by the church as a whole later. And so there's, again, there's no reason to believe that that's something we're obligated to believe much, much alone. It was ever 
something that was supposed to be believed anyway. Hmm. And so there's, yeah. Um, but mostly though, I, I, I do commend you trying to like reach out to, you know, letting me kind of come on here and talk about this, but I, what I really want to be able to do at the end of the day, because I could sit here and I could round, I could prattle on about specific concerns that I have about the Godmakers cartoon, but to an extent, I kind of feel as if that would be beating a dead horse, because I could, I, I, if there's a specific concern that you or your viewers would like to bring up, then I'm happy to address it. But, um, yeah, that's that's kind of where my head is at. If if we uh, if I, I'd be more interested in having at ask, answering questions that you have than I would be just to kind of bring stuff up and then answer my own questions. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how useful or how interesting that would be for you and your viewers. And so I, I would much rather be more direct and address some of these concerns as directly as I possibly can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that sounds good. That sounds good. Um, so shall we start uh, letting the viewers ask some questions? Uh, sure. All right, uh, I have one here. Let's see. Uh, thank you, Edwin Vasquez, for ten dollars. You are awesome. I'm gonna buy some ice cream with that. Um, question for Zachary: Do you have any friends or friends that have left the Mormon Church, and if so, do you still talk to them? Uh, so the answer to that is: When they want to still be my friends, yes, I do. Uh, the a, a lot of the time, though, the it, it tends to be I, I at least from my view. In my experience, I have found it that they are less likely to want to talk to me if they have left the church, not necessarily the other way around. Mm, okay, so so do you think that um, maybe it's not the same anymore when, when someone stops believing it's not, it's not the same connection? Uh, I suppose that's possible. I'd like to say that that shouldn't affect my ability to connect with them on a, you know, on a deep level and have a fulfilling relationship with them. I mean, I have people who I am friends with who are no longer members of the church or no longer um, no longer are active or have really complicated feelings about the history. Because there's like a spectrum of like where people identify themselves as being in relationship with the church. But regardless of that, I would say that there's, there's no, I, I, from my view, I have no qualms with being friends with people who are no longer members of the church. I would say I'm friends with some of them now. And I have no problem. I don't think the church obligates anybody or mandates that you shouldn't associate with people who are no longer members of the church. But we, we, we've kind of already talked about that. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, XJW Caleb asks, um, would you see yourself being a Jehovah's Witness? <laughs> um, I I don't I, I I have a I have hard times with questions like that because I I I, I lean more towards no, but the the, the thing is the, the the fact of the matter is is I I view religious I I view myself as wanting to accept truth wherever it is found, and in a hypothetical sense, I mean the Jehovah's Witnesses teach a, a couple of things I would argue that are good and I would agree with. You know, praying is good, studying the scriptures is good. You can agree on that. Uh, there are a couple of things that I think the Jehovah's Witnesses do that I don't think are necessary, and I don't think align well with their worldview. But at the end of the day, I can't really... Um, when the cards all fall, they all fall, and I end up where I'm at. So I, I, while I can say that I, I, I don't, I don't probably see myself becoming Jehovah's Witnesses if I, was, if I was ever to leave the church. If I was to leave the church, I'd probably end up becoming an atheist. Most that's how I viewed it. That's how I've guessed I would end up. Mm -hmm. But in short, if if I was to join the Jehovah's Witnesses, it would be because I have found their arguments to be the most compelling based on the data, which is why I was trying to do some study on them in the first place anyway. So that's actually how I found you. Okay, wonderful. Um, so let's see. Uh, Tiago, probably from Brazil, uh, does a highs. What is the view of the Mormon church about LGBTQ at the moment? Uh, 
we love them freely. We invite everybody to come unto Christ. Uh, members of the LGBTQ plus community have a tendency to have better mental health outcomes than non-members of the church. I would say that it is a view of love and it is a, a view of desire just to have everybody come to Christ. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's... Uh, so No, go ahead. Um, uh, a gay member of the church, do you think they have a, a hard, harder time overall? Uh, it's uh, like I said before, I, I think it depends. Like uh, on average, they tend to have better mental health outcomes, lower suicide rates, which is really, really good because it's my understanding that members of the LGBTQ plus community have very, very high rates of suicidality. Um, so in while I would say that the, the view of the church is to obey the, the law of chastity in the sense that relations are supposed to be uh, relation, uh, sexual relations are to be confined within the bounds of marriage between a man and a woman. So while I would say that you would not be able to get a, um, you would not be able to have two gay men or two lesbian women be sealed in the temple. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're not allowed to attend church. That does not mean that we are not allowed to have relationships with them. That does not mean that they would not be able to uh, while I while I imagine there might be if there's a, there's a little bit of leeway in terms of how the bishop decides to handle that. By and large, the church doesn't really have a strong position on members of who are LGBTQ plus must do X, Y, and Z things. And so I it's it, it's just like I said because of that it's varies. It's a little bit subjective. That's that's what the data says. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> Talking a little bit about the law of chastity, I knew this question would would show up. Um, ask him how he feels about. <laughs> How about soaking? What is that? <laughs> For, it's not a thing. Is that a thing? It's an urban legend. I, maybe one guy did it, and it's just a legend that just got passed around. I, I, it just, I don't know. All right, and I don't know <laughs> what I don't know. It's, it's just, it seems so dumb. It's, I, 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 I could not tell you anything about it. I, I don't think it's much of a thing at all. I, I just. Okay. Okay, okay, fair it's, enough. It's just, uh, why? Yeah, uh, so whoever is interested in learning about it, you can Google it. It's not that hard. <laughs> but I knew I knew it would come up eventually. Uh, let's see, we have we have a lot of questions. Sorry, guys, if we can't reach all of them, but I'll, I'll try to put up the most interesting ones. Uh, Ruby Quinn asks, uh, Zachary, can you date and marry a non-LDS Yes, I've known members of the church who have dated outside of um, outside of the faith, um, with varying degrees of whether or not you know their their spouse eventually joins the church or not. Um, the the same thing kind of happens the opposite way, where both members you know both members of the church start out being members, and then one spouse leaves and the other one decides to stay, or one spouse leaves and then another one follows. Hypothetically, um, it's it's it shouldn't have much of a bearing on the relationship. Uh, besides, you know, fundamental values, things like if, you know, one parent decides they want to go out drinking every single night and the other parent's not okay with that, that might cause problems. And so while you might have some things like that that might affect the relationship, it's not necessarily because the church is saying you can't date or marry people outside of the faith. As much as it is, make sure that you find people who share your values and are willing to raise your, raise your children in a gospel-centered home. Hmm. And would you personally marry someone non-LDS at the moment? Well, I'm in a happily committed relationship, and so the answer is I'm I'm the you know, I would only choose to date my girlfriend. How about that? Okay, but she's she's LDS. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. Um, cool. Uh, let's see. This one's interesting. Uh, why is the afterlife so misogynistic? The men supposedly become gods, while all the women are able to. <laughs> do is be pregnant for all of eternity that's a very loaded statement so um yeah tell us a little bit about the mormon afterlife the the, the celestial kingdom um my question would be how is it misogynistic I, I i struggle to see that when it's understood from our theology that you know when we are sealed we are able to both men and women are able to be become like, you know, it's our belief that God's purpose for us is to become like him. Uh, what that fully entails, we're not entirely sure. There's, there's speculation behind that, 
but there's there's no reason to assume that a the afterlife is misogynistic b that men are able to become gods and women are not and you know c that this would have a lot of practical significance in how we would live our lives today um i think it would be bold of men to assume that they can just boss women around mm -hmm. maybe um Maybe they're calling me misogynistic. Um, so, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a man can be sealed to multiple women, right? Uh, but can a woman be sealed to multiple men? Uh, depends on the time of church history, I think. So, for example, it's the, uh, the vocabulary behind it is complicated. The short answer, I think, is the ceiling has to be broken off before a woman can be sealed to another man. I Why that is, I think I, I couldn't necessarily say, but, but a lot of those questions kind of stem back from just questions about polygamy in general, which a lot of people just kind of have to reckon. There's not really a way that I can answer that because a lot of it does go back to speculation. A lot of it does go back to uh kind of what the original kind of what Joseph Smith and what, what the Doctrine of Covenants kind of say about polygamy, which in reality isn't all that much. So I I just don't think that there's a lot that we can presuppose about that. Uh, Elder, Elder Oaks, who's an apostle at this time, gave a talk to this effect where it basically says, we're not entirely sure how this is going to plan out. This is what the scriptures say. This is what it does not say. Just, uh, the best we can do is just try to express love and try to be understanding of the specific things. Yes, that, that would be, that's what the current handbook says. Okay, so so, so if a woman um, ha wants to be sealed to another man, maybe she's a widow and then she got married again, she would have to break the ceiling, right? Uh, that seems to be what the current handbook says. Okay, and... Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but the current president Nelson, it, he he had a previous wife, and then he the wife died, right? Sadly, and and he got remarried and got sealed to another woman. So, in the current understanding, he's gonna have two wives in the celestial kingdom. But that goes back to what I was saying. We're just we just don't know. And the thing is, uh, Elder Oaks has a situation that's very much similar to that, mm -hmm. and he gave that talk very explicitly, saying there's no there's no reason to assume that. Uh, we are going to, I'm, you know, for all intents and purposes, I assume he was talking about himself because you know, the letter, he was talking about a letter that was written to him. And so I state that to you as my opinion. If I had a tie, I'd flip it over my shoulder right now. But the uh, the short answer is is that we're just not entirely sure. So I, I, I don't think it would be fair to say it is the current understanding that that's the case. But that's the long and the short of it. Okay. Uh, that sounds fair. No worries. Um, <laughs> we have a question by Kim Jong Un. Thanks, Kim Jong Un, for joining the chat. Um, I didn't know North Korea has internet. Um, so, when may you you join the LDS? Um, were you always a part of the church? I think he missed your introduction. So yeah. Uh, so I I've, I've always been a member of the church. I uh, but I've really done my best to try and understand other religions to see. But I, the more that I've studied other religions and the more I've studied my religion, I think that that's uh, – I, I, I do kind of like where I'm at, and I think I'm I'm in a good spot. Okay, that's fair. Um, now I have a question for myself. Uh, Panda Tower, will you ever convert to Mormonism? Uh, no, I love coffee too much. <laughs> uh, a question related to that, why can't you drink coffee? Why can't I drink? Well, the uh, there are, again, there are a couple of theories behind that. The short answer is it's because we are in the word of wisdom, which is a commandment that's outlined in the Doctrine of Covenants uh, and was made kind of, um, it was made a part of the Temple Recommend Questions, which is uh, which is understood to how, how members of the church can get a Temple Recommend. Uh, basically, it's understood that members of the church are not allowed to, or they're, they're asked to abstain from Alcohol, tobacco, drugs, coffee, and tea. So that, that's kind of what's outlined in the Word of Wisdom. Uh, to the extent that that is related to health is up to debate. But the reason why is what I've explained before. It's the, the fact that 
in in the word of wisdom, it is advised that we don't. Yeah, um, and in the word of wisdom, the wording would be hot drinks, right? Which is hot interpreted drinks. as coffee. Yeah, coffee and tea. Mm -hmm. And um, do you ever see the because? Uh, from what I understand, previously soda was also very looked down upon, and now I'm sorry. You, from what I understand, soda was previously very frowned upon, right? In in Mormon culture, uh, I'd have to go back and look over that. But I, again, that kind of goes back to if it is, it is because it relates to the principle behind the word of wisdom, which other leaders have talked about. Just say, hey, just don't do stuff that's bad for your body. Uh, mm -hmm. that is that is a general principle that has been explicated around the word of wisdom so if something like that was to occur it would likely be within that context mm. and if current uh mormon uh, or the current prophet the current president went out to to say that uh, mormons can now drink coffee like it's allowed now um how would you view that um I mean that that's kind of a that's more of a theological question, right? That wouldn't be something that I would be able to answer right off the bat. It would be something I would take up with God and kind of try and figure out for myself. I'm not sure I could add, answer that question right now. Okay, it's fair. No worries. Uh, oh, here's a cool one. <laughs> uh, let's see. What do you think about the Book of Mormon musical? <laughs> Catchy songs. It sometimes says things that are inaccurate. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, it is a, a very ca a catchy, catchy musical. Um, do you have it in Utah? Does, uh, does it... Perhaps. I if, if it is, I'm not sure where it would be playing. And I think there, my question at that point would be who would go and see it. But the, I'll, I'll put it to you this way, Panda. I think the book is better. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, I have I haven't read the book. It's it's on my to do list, but I got so many projects that I have to finish. Uh, but yeah, I'll prom I'll promise I'll I'll read the book of Mormon one day. I promise. Um, okay, let's see. And if you have any questions for me, please let me know. Okay, we're gonna do one more question, and then we're gonna see if you have questions for me as well. Sure. Uh, how does the LDS Church see Christianity or the rest of the Christian religions? Uh, so the 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 short answer is that. Uh, we believe that members, well, we believe that God has consistently tried to interact with his people. We would look back to the biblical texts. We would look back to the Old and New Testament. We would look back to the Book of Mormon. We would look back to modern day in the sense that we believe that God has tried to interact with other, with other people. So in that sense, we believe that God is interacting and working through members of, you know, Christians all around the world, both inside and outside the church, as well as you know, inspired people who may or may not identify as Christians to kind of help spread truth and be able to, you know, help people in that regard. Uh, we do hold to this idea of a great apostasy, wherein you have people or general Christians within the early centuries who over time, and it didn't, it's some, not something that happened overnight, where they began to reject the idea that God calls prophets to, you know, direct the church and to help kind of the believers along the way. So when, when a great apostasy is mentioned, that's the context you should be looking at. So that isn't to say that everything that the early church did was fundamentally wrong. A great book that, I meant to do that. Uh, <laughs> that the uh, This is a great book that came out from BYU, Religious Studies, uh, Ancient Christians, an Introduction for Latter-day Saints, where it kind of talks a little bit about what early Christians believed. So it's not like we're scared of what other Christians have to offer, what the early church believed, or even that we fully expect our church to match up one for one with kind of what the what, like the early centuries or the early Christians believed. But what we do expect is kind of this idea that we, we notice a pattern in the sense that God talked with, you know, talked with his believers or interacted through prophets to interact with his believers in the old Testament. He did the same thing with apostles in the new Testament. And all we're doing is we're, we're saying God is doing that today. Okay, perfect. Um, and just one more question, because uh, it's from apostate ministry school. Um, what evidence do we have for reformed Egyptian? Joseph Smith claimed to translate it, but only Mormon scholars seem to accept it. Um, you would need to explain what Reformed Egyptian is. It's one phrase that's mentioned in the Book of Mormon. Uh, we don't, there's not, 
the, all we know is that that's what the Book of Mormon authors called it. We don't expect it, other people to have called it Reformed Egyptian. What we do see is some Egyptians, uh, we see Egyptian writings that are better translated into Hebrew, and we see a relationship there. But what we don't expect to see is people calling one specific script uh, or one specific set of characters as Reformed Egyptian. I just don't think that that's what uh, scholars today accept. I don't think that's what people outside the church accept. Uh, so there's there's just no reason to believe that. Okay, sounds good. And uh, Apostate and, Ministries, oh, sorry, go ahead. And, and one thing I want, to, I want to be able to get across here is that I hope that as I'm answering these questions, I'm not coming across as dodgy. Like, I, I hope that what I'm saying is making sense and it's not, uh, it's, it's not coming across as me just trying to manipulate the conversation. I, I just want, I just want to make sure that these answers are, do, do, these answers are satisfactory. They're making sense, that sort of thing. Yeah, no, no worries, no worries. It's, uh, it's just two dudes chatting. No worries. <laughs> we're good. Uh, okay, guys. Uh, we're gonna save some more questions for later. So I'm, I'm gonna save them and, and we're gonna share them right now. Zach, do you have a, some questions for me? Maybe, uh, I'm sure you're interested in learning a little bit about JWs. So just a couple of things i can't imagine it would be it would be a ton of information or a, a ton of questions so could you talk to me a little bit more about the prospect of shunning i yeah. i feel like that there's there's i'm hearing different stuff from different sources and it's it's difficult for me to kind of um parse what the actual position is yeah uh, um just from your experience, I'm, I'm, that's, that's what I'm asking. How about that? Okay, so, um, so in the Jehovah's Witness religion, there's, um, there's di dis various degrees of discipline, right? So if you commit what, what they call a grave sin, which is usually sex before marriage, that's, um, or like stealing, but no one steals, so it's sex before marriage usually, or watching pornography or smoking weed, um. So you go confess to the elders, which are like the, the you know, the, the pastors. It's, it's a group of elders in each congregation. And you confess your sin. And if it's a grave sin, if you had sex before marriage, you get disciplined, right? So the elders have to determine if you're repentant or not. So they're going to judge your, pretty much pretend to read your heart almost. Like they'll determine how repentant you are. So they take a lot of factors into consideration. Like, did, did you go to confess to them or did someone else bring it to them, to their attention? You know, what happened? Uh, how repentant did you look? Uh, did you do any changes in your life? So a lot of things. And it also depends on the elders as well. Some are more harsh than others. So if you did something very wrong, the least you can have is a reproof. And if you get reproved in the congregation, uh, you're not allowed to do comments you're not allowed to read the bible in public you're 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 stripped from every any privileges in the congregation right and all, all you can do is go to the meetings and preach but if the elders decide to disfellowship you which is what we call df you're df uh you are completely shunned by the community so you're not allowed to socialize with the congregation at all so you're not allowed well, when to you mean socialize it's you can't talk to them you can't talk to them at all yeah okay. like yeah so how does that work within families well within families it varies um for example i've heard a lot of stories of parents kicking out their 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 children after their disfellowship um it used to it used to happen a lot in in hispanic families if if the girl got pregnant she would be uh, kicked out of her house um so it depends on each family usually for the most part um the the children are allowed to stay uh and family relations go on if you if you live with your family in in the same house but but other family that doesn't live with you uh they're expected to not talk to you like at all so you can only talk to your, your like um, your mom, your dad, you know, your brothers that are immediately in your, in your house. Um, so and, I guess, yeah. no, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, so that's it. If you can only be this fellowship, if you're baptized, right? So, so it, if you get baptized and you get this fellowship, you're shunned. But if you, if you don't get baptized and you, 
make a, a big sin, the same sin, right? They can't disfellowship you because you're not baptized. So, so it, it all depends on the family, but yeah, you're completely cut off from your community and it's very harsh. Like you can't talk to your parents if you don't live with them. And it, it has broken a lot of families. I, I I can definitely see that, and I, I guess my follow up question to I, my follow up question to that, because again, I'm coming at this from from someone who has never been to Jehovah's Witness and is trying to learn more about it. And I, I guess my my question back to you is is how widespread is that? Is that literally you, you mentioned kind of the difference between some communities over others? Would that necessarily be localized to? certain communities where it is just you're just not expected to talk to anyone is there some areas where it's hypothetically more lenient or mm, well it's it's very widespread i would say it's pretty much worldwide because um it's like jw's are very uniform like they, they're they they learn exactly the same things no matter where you are it's a very it's a very odd uh, how do you call it um authoritarian religion <laughs> so so it, some families will be less harsh on the shunning. Uh, it just varies depending on the family. But the rules apply like equally across the board. And I, I would say like, yeah, there are some communities that are more fanatical, like um, Hispanic JWs are very fanatical. Um, African JWs are very fanatical. Uh, I'm not sure about the rest. Maybe Europeans are a little bit more lenient, but shunning does happily, does happen everywhere and it, it's, it's very widespread and recently uh, the norwegian government cracked down on on the jehovah's witnesses in norway and they were stripped of their religious status because of the, they shun children <laughs> hmm. yeah i i guess i just have a I, there's part of me that has a hard time believing that um every single member within a specific organization is the exact same and they have the exact same presuppositions the same worldview i mean granted why I, I certainly would agree that there are certain there are certain patterns that we find within religions uh patterns of belief patterns of behavior that sort of thing i i guess there's a part of me that struggles to believe that every single jehovah's witness is you know of the same opinion that it is okay or it is necessary to shun people who no longer believe and that might just me be me coming into this with my own presuppositions, but I, I don't know. There's, I, I guess I just, there's a part of me that, that, that just is still a little bit confused about that in particular. Yeah. Uh, and of course, like not all JWs, like every person has their own like way of processing the faith. Like they're, they're not robots, um, but the same rules do apply like across the board. So um, how they're how they're applied vary depending on where you are and which family it is, but it's yeah, the, it's the same dogma like everywhere. And and recently um, they just made a change, um, like man, like like two weeks ago, where the governing body, which are the top leaders, decided that you can now you can now say hi to a disfellowship person and invite them to the meetings, and. So, so you can like send them a text message to invite them to to the church, but that's it. Like that's that's the only thing you're allowed to do. You're you're still not allowed to socialize, um, and I think the, the the governing body is seeing that they have to relax some of their harsh guidelines eventually, uh, or else the governments will keep cracking down on them. And they they they've been instituting more changes to to the religion. They they now allow beards. <laughs> now Jehovah's Witnesses can have a beard before they couldn't, and now women can wear pants to to the meeting, which was not allowed. <laughs> so it's it's going in a more liberal direction for sure. So with that with, with that question in mind, uh, do you think there's any reason why you would go back to the Jehovah's Witnesses? Uh, no, 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 because uh, uh, I just don't. I think I've, I've debunked the religion in, in, in my mind, like completely um, to the point where if I ever went to, if I ever, ever had to go back, it, I, I would have to pretend to believe because it's, it's like the evidence against it is just so overwhelming that it's, I can't pretend to, to believe in it, you know? Okay. And that, I, I can kind of see where you're, I, I, I can see 
where you're coming from on that. I guess there's a part of me that wonders just how much certainty we can debunk a religion anyway using objective criteria. I believe you and other men videos have mentioned, for example, that you can't really use science to prove or disprove God. Mm -hmm. yeah, and correct. so I, um, I guess there's a part of me that wonders how you would go about disproving, for example, that uh, God exists, which is why I thought it was interesting enough that you said that you were an atheist as opposed to an agnostic. Do you, do you care? Um, do you, I, I guess I'm just wondering, would you classify yourself more as an atheist or as an agnostic? Um, well, I mean, the usual label is agnostic atheist. Um, okay. Yeah, which is like an atheist that is open to the possibility of God, but I'm not I'm not going to say that, oh, I'm certain God doesn't exist because I, I, okay. I, cannot, I cannot say that with certainty. <laughs> right, um, right. It, it's it's a most, question of epistemology, but sorry, go ahead. Pretty much, yeah. And most atheists are agnostic atheists. You, I, I haven't met a lot of atheists that are like gnostic atheists, like, oh, yeah, I'm certain that God doesn't exist. Um, because it, it's it's just an untestable hypothesis. You know, it's how can you prove or dis I don't think you can prove or disprove God um, using evidence. You know, it, it all comes down to it faith. is. It, from a scientific perspective, I think many would mm -hmm. classify it as an um, unfalsifiable claim. Yes, yes, exactly. Where, um, and that's that. That's honestly okay with me, be, because at least from my view, I think that there's room for, I, I think there's room for belief in terms of just how much uncertainty there is in the world. And I am grateful to, for my faith system, which kind of provides grace for those differences. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess my, my question to you and then, would be what would be evidence that would allow you as a and I, I know i'm getting off topic here so you can tell me to shut no, up at any it's time okay no worries, uh, no worries. the my, my question back to you would be what would be a standard that would be acceptable to you in order to accept that god does exist um i think i think the the question of god's existence is not the most important thing let me explain <laughs> because Please. if if we were to prove tomorrow that there's a god like like completely completely prove that there's a god right okay. that would that would still not make christianity true like we would still what i mean is we would still need to prove that this god is the same god as the biblical god you know so so to me, it's more to me personally. It's more interesting to to prove the claims of 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 our holy books uh, instead of getting too uh, preoccupied with proving God's existence, because um, like yeah, like Christians get very hung up on oh how can you not believe in God like uh, you know there's just so much evidence for him or whatever, but if we were to prove God's existence today, you would still need to prove your holy book correct because you got the Bible, you got the Quran, you got the uh, the Bhagavad, the, the Hindu text, you know. Uh, they're all claiming to be divine. You would still need to prove that their claims are an aligning with reality. And I think that's that's my take on it. I'm not too preoccupied with with if God exists or not, I'm, if if it were to come down to a debate, I would be willing to grant the existence of God just just for to make the discussion easier, because accepting God exists doesn't make your particular claims true. I don't know if I'm explaining myself. But. No, I can kind of see where you're coming from. Where it, to you, it is more important to understand the claims of the the texts themselves than it is to discuss whether or not uh, God actually exists. Yeah. Yeah, because, oh man, it's it's because it, it's it, the discussion around God's existence is, is very philosophical. There's there's things that are more persuasive to certain people, and um, it, if you try to if you try to disprove God's existence to someone, it just comes off as, as gaslighting them because every every religious person has had experiences that feels supernatural. Maybe you felt the Holy Spirit. Maybe, maybe maybe you felt God's help in your life. And when you go tell someone that, oh, God doesn't exist, it 
maybe it feels to them that you're telling them, hey, you're you're crazy, like you're making it up. Uh, so to me, it's to me it's unproductive to to try to convince someone that God doesn't exist because it's just a very personal thing. Like it's something that I have gone through as well when I was a Jehovah's Witness that I I felt God's presence in my life. I felt His Spirit. I felt uh, events that I felt His hand in working in my life. And it's just something that is, how can you reason people out of that? You know, it's impossible. It's impossible to, to, to convince someone that they're, it's all in their head. And it feels very gaslighty to me to try to do that. So I think that's, that's one of the things that, that, that really broke my faith and personally, because I realized that people of all religions have these supernatural experiences and who am I to claim that my experience was the true one, while the experience of a Muslim or a Mormon or a Buddhist was was wrong? They just made it up in their heads, you know. So I think that's the problem with discussing religion. It's it's just there's no way to convince people out of it. It's impossible. Hmm. I I can kind of see where you're coming from. If if I would, I would like to push back against that a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. Because that, that's been a criticism that's been leveled against all religions by by atheists of all different types, and I think that it's worth addressing. So within our theology, we believe that truth exists in all places. I think I mentioned that earlier. And so I ha I personally have no problem granting the idea that people have had spiritual experiences inside and outside the faith. In the same sense, I would have no I have no doubt, at least from my worldview, that you have had spiritual experiences, or I would attribute that to being spiritual experiences. You are right, though, in saying that it is at least somewhat subjective. But at that point, I have to, I am also somebody who has no problem citing intuition as being a legitimate source of information, which is why I would say that a lot of those kind of spiritual impressions, so to speak, actually come from. And so, well, I would argue that you know, the Holy Ghost, for example, does speak to people through behavior outcome, reason, and intuition, which I, I would consider all to be very valid epistemic resources. I guess I just have a problem seeing why that would be an issue for the Spirit to be speaking to other people outside of my faith tradition to teach truth, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, because you're you're a little more open to that idea that that the Holy Spirit, um, you know, can can interact with people of other faiths, but the thing is, like, not everyone is as open-minded as you, and and a lot of a lot of Christians would never accept the idea that that God would speak to a Muslim or a Buddhist or, you know, it, it's like not everyone has not everyone is able to realize that. Uh, well, and, and to be fair, not a lot of faith traditions kind of think about spiritual revelation in that way. That is a very kind of a Western Christian idea, mm -hmm. whereas I would argue that maybe someone who is more Hindu, who, who is a Hindu or a Buddhist, might not exactly think of it that way. The, um, like I've read texts from like the Bhagavad Gita, for example. I've, I've read the Quran. I've tried to make sure that I'm at least relatively knowledgeable in a couple of different faith traditions and their conceptualizations of what god is is at least somewhat different and so that would entail that their conceptualization of spiritual experiences or the source of said spiritual experiences are different so we have to account for that too yes exactly it's just yeah man it's it's, it's um i don't know it's difficult um like i i'm like i've said in the channel before i'm 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 not interested like in um, taking people out of their faiths, you know, because I understand that that faith is is useful to to some people, and it's um it's not something I would like to take away from them if if, if they're not ready to to leave it. it because I left for very pragmatic reasons, like it was it was damaging to my mental health personally, you know. At, at some point, that's why I had to leave because to keep my own sanity. But there's people that can stay in a religion, even if it's controlling, and they'll be fine. Like, they'll make it work. It's, it's because everyone is different. You know, everyone has different experiences. And, for example, you know, some some Mormons will be in the church forever, and they'll be, they'll be fine. They'll be happy and genuinely content, you know. But there are some people that it just doesn't work for them eventually, and they have to take a different path. So I think it's important to just be able to listen to people's experiences and that that gives you new perspectives on on why people would 
choose to remain in a religion that you don't agree with, you know? I I can kind of see that, yeah. And I, I, to an extent, I really don't have a problem for when people leave the church. I think that my theology has accommodations for that sort of thing. But the the only issue that I may have is when somebody then turns around and then says that my worldview is fundamentally wrong and then proceed to say that I am a member of a cult or just not informed, or I was once told I was the devil's sock puppet, which is the weirdest <laughs> insult I think I've ever received ever. Yeah. Um, but I, on one hand, I can kind of see where you're coming from, but also within my heart, if I'm going to be totally honest with you, Panda, there's a part of me that, that wishes that everybody would believe the same way that I do in the sense that I, I do like what I believe. And I think it makes sense. I think it's helpful. I really love the idea of sharing my beliefs with other people in ways that can be beneficial to them. It's why I served a mission. It's why I continue in discussions like this today. And I um, I look forward to when you read the Book of Mormon, because I think it provides a lot of interesting insights. I think it provides insights into the nature of why God might want to continue talking to us today. And I, I think that just about anywhere, if nothing else, I, I would hope that you would be able to understand the Book of Mormon for what it truly is and what it truly implies. And so that that's one thing that I can, that, that's one thing that I would recommend to you. Oh, you know, it would be fun. We should like, you should, you should do live streams where you read the Book of Mormon with me or with a couple of buddies of mine, just to, just to kind of have like a little study group. That would be fun. Yeah, <laughs> but one, one day, one day, one maybe. day, one day, and th there's no pressure behind that either. It was just it, it's it's a thought that I think might be helpful to you as you continue on your quest for truth and sharing experiences and fostering critical thinking. Hopefully, yeah, for sure, and that's yeah, that's the objective to always um, improve on our knowledge and keep an open mind because like i've said i'm i'm always open to to the idea of god existing but um i just i'm just not convinced of christianity anymore you know and it's uh, that the thing about beliefs is that uh, i think i think beliefs ultimately people don't have complete control over what they believe like it's if i don't believe in christianity it's because i don't find it convincing you know it's and other people might find it convincing but it, it's just in my personal experience i do not find it convincing anymore so um yeah i mean i'm always I, I love learning about other religions and i always talk about them but um yeah man it's just it's just we it's just good to dialogue because every every mind is different <laughs> it's impossible to yeah damn. Yeah. Um, and, and I hope that as we've been talking, yeah, like I said, I hope that I've been able to answer some of these questions in a way where you, you might not have to agree with me, but at least it makes sense from a logical perspective. Yeah, yeah, for that, sure. It, that, would, that would be my hope, because I, I, I would never want to impose and demand that everybody agree with me. But what I do want to get across is that I think that there are logically consistent and compelling reasons to believe what I believe. And if you want to accept them, great. I know a couple of guys you can talk to. But on the other hand, I understand that if that's not the case, then we can still have genuine connection and we can become better by just dialoguing and having good discussions about it. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's, um, let's see if we have some final questions for today. And That sounds some, great. Yeah. So, so guys, if you have any more questions for Zach, please leave them in the comments below um, so we can, um, yeah, we went through so much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so much information. I mean, we could talk all day about this, but um, so it, what, what kind of videos would you like to see on the, on the channel? If I, if I keep talking about Mormonism. So if you continue to talk about it, one of the things I would hope you would be able to do is get, make sure that when you talk to people, you find informed members of the church. So you can find, you can pick up just anybody from the street and try and do that. There are a lot, but the problem is, is that there are informed and there are uninformed members of the church just about anywhere and everywhere. And so there's no reason to 
I, I, I would hope that I, I would hope that as you try to discuss what members of the church actually believe, you would want to talk to people who both believe and also are, you know, relatively well informed. Uh, I have a couple of people I, I think you would have an interesting and a fun time talking with. But so for that would just be kind of an example. But additionally, I I would hope that you would engage with kind of the scholarly up-to-date material that's that's on the Book of Mormon and on LDS theology and history, excuse me. And that, that would be another hope that I would have. Um, and also just, you know, making sure that as you're dialoguing about it, you're understanding that I, or at least I, I would hope that you would go into it believing not necessarily that there's, you know, being a member of the church isn't a live option in the same sense you believe that intellectually speaking, being a member, or just being a Jehovah's Witness or a general Christian altogether uh, would, wouldn't be a live option in terms of belief, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So those were, those are a few things off the top of my head. And then also just kind of referring your people to kind of certain websites where they can, or websites or books or other things where they might be able to get the best information on it. I know that you, from your videos, I was able to kind of guess where you got most of your information. Um, I'm, I'm going to make a couple guesses here. You watched the Johnny Harris video, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I used that for some of the footage because uh, he made some cool right. graphics. That's true, yeah. And so I um I have some mixed feelings about that specific video. I think that there's... um. It does make a couple of implications I'm not sure are entirely true. Mm -hmm. So just kind of making sure that you understand your view, you and your viewers understand the bias of what sources you're getting from and both positive and negative. Uh, just make sure that um, you listen to what members of the church have to say about said bias and just make sure that you're, um, make sure that you are being intellectually consistent and understanding kind of what, um, making sure you're accurately representing. I'm not saying that's not what you've done so far. Uh, although I would, I would be con what I, what I got the impression from from your videos, is that you were trying to learn, but uh, some of the sources you were pulling from are, are either at least somewhat misleading, or have information in them that is incorrect. Mm -hmm. Um, my biggest. I would hope that that was that would be what you do. I that I, I'm sorry. That was that was kind of a long rant. I don't mean to. I don't mean to boss you around. No, that's uh, okay. and and I'm I'm trying to be genuine here too. I I. But that's um. That that would be my hope that we could continue to have positive discussion. We could talk about why we believe what we believe, um, and just kind of try and figure out truth wherever we can find it. That's the short answer. Perfect. That's that's great, man. Um, all right, we're gonna put a few more questions and then we'll call it a day. Um, from George Washington, are there any parts of LDS that you dislike? Um. So when we're talking about parts of the Latter Day Saints that I dislike, I'm not entirely sure what that's referring to. I mean, if we're talking about culturally speaking, I've got things up to my eyeballs. Um, in terms of our theology, though, I, 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 I do find it to be relatively intellectually consistent and meaningful uh, sometimes, but you, you can kind of get people who are rather dogmatic about their beliefs and it can be difficult to dialogue with them. You can find some people who, and you can find people who just don't live good principles regardless of what religion they are, but I don't think that's something that's unique to the LDS, and so that that's kind of where my thought is initially there. Okay. Uh, was there any part of um, current LDS LDS theology do you disagree with? Um, the thing is, LDS theology is a complicated phrase to define because it basically boils down to everything that is true. I mean, the the 13th article of faith basically says we believe all things, um, we help all things, we've endured many things. If there's anything virtuous, lovely, or good report or praiseworthy, we seek after these things. And uh, Henry Eyring, who's not to be confused with the current apostle, um, and I believe it was his father, basically said, you're not going to be obligated to believe something that isn't true. And so from my point of view, 
to try and say that I dislike LDS theology, or at least in the way that I think this this question is being described, I think is to kind of I, I don't think fully represents what I how I view LDS theology and what that entails. Because the way I see it, it's I I want to believe everything that is true. And I know if there are multiple places where I can get that is true. Um, but yeah, that's that's the short of it. Not that's the long and the short of it. So so you agree with everything that's current? Um, as it stands right now, I don't think that. Well, it depends on what you mean by current. And I'm sorry, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to be coy here as I'm as I'm saying this sort of thing but the, the problem is is that there's a little bit of intellectual variety within what members believe so for example i would say that some members do believe that god the father does have a father and i would say that some members of the church believe that god the father does not have a father so but i i guess in the sense that i believe that uh, there is a God in the sense that I believe that Jesus Christ does exist, and in the sense that I try to live the um, standards that are outlined in like the Temple Recommend questions, in the sense I try to follow things like the Word of Wisdom, the Law of Chastity, that sort of thing, I, I don't see any problem with that, and I don't find any reason to not believe those things as it stands right now. Okay, fair enough. Uh, oh man, here's another rabbit hole we didn't even cover. Uh, so for those that don't know, in Utah, there's still uh, there's still polygamous Mormons. They're still fundamentalists, right? Uh, so they are. So there are a couple of different breakaway sects. Um, in the same way that uh, general Christianity has had some kind of breakaway sects, the there are some who have. Dis, uh, there are some breakaway sects, so to speak. None. Of, it's my understanding that. Uh, a lot of them have kind of shifted around in their theology. So, for example, the uh, a good example of this is the Community of Christ, which was understood to be the restored um, the the RLDS Church, um, which was um, for those who don't know that was a that was taken over by the uh, that that was Joseph Smith's son, Joseph Smith the third who who is the first prophet there but over time their theology and their focus has somewhat shifted and it's kind of blended more into general christianity so for example i believe they believe reorganized i'm sorry um the uh so their their, their theology has shifted around a little bit so i'm not entirely i'm, I'm not entirely sure if they were fully justified in shifting those positions around. So for example, if you, if some, some sex were to believe the Trinity, for instance, there's argument about whether or not the Trinity is actually supposed to be imposed onto the biblical texts themselves. And so I don't think that that's really, I, I am, um, I would have questions for them in, in that regard, in terms of biblical scholarship, but the, that's kind of my, that, that's kind of my view on it. I, there are, there's, there are certainly similarities. There are differences. I would have questions for them about the differences, and I would, um, I would hope that we would be able to continue to have dialogue about that specifically. So, but it's safe to say that there's there's Mormon sects right now in Utah that that still practice polygamy. Um, yes, but they have no connection with the sect that I, that I, right. you know, it's, they're not, to. they're not LDS. They're, they're Mormon, but breakaways. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I find that super fascinating that this is still going on. I mean, polygamy is not legal anymore, but it can be done, I guess, under the table in the privacy of your own home. Um, but yeah, that would be a fascinating world to delve into if, if, uh, if a fundamentalist Mormon is watching this, please reach out to me. We can have you in the channel next. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not sure of like what other kind of discussions I had that, or if there are other questions, but I, I hope that that was a satisfactory answer. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, okay. Well, I think that's all the questions we have for today. All right. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed our little chat. Uh, you are very knowledgeable, and um, and I really enjoyed this this discussion. It, it was it was quite quite enjoyable. 
Sure. And I, I enjoyed chatting with you too. Uh, my hope is that we would be able to do this again at some point if you have additional questions or stuff, uh, other stuff you want to be able to cover. Uh, is, is it okay if I give a couple of plug for the a couple of things that I'm in myself? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so I don't have my own YouTube channel, but I am at least cursorily familiar and acquainted with uh, Fair LDS. Um, that's a uh, used to be Fair Mormon. The uh, you can take a look at some of my my stuff there. I've done a series on critical thinking, which I, I think would be practical and useful for you and your viewers if you wanted to take a look at that. Um, I, I've, I've, of course, sent that interview over with you that I did with an, an LDS apologist by the name of Robert Boylan. He himself is very informed. I would certainly recommend his work on a kind of understanding LDS theology and history. Uh, Besides that, I, I have a couple of others. Um, I, I, I have a couple of, uh, I have another video, hopefully you can, you can send it where I go a little bit more in depth on kind of like my faith journey, which I know we didn't get to talk to, a, I'll, I'll talk a lot about, but if, if they want to reach out to me, I, um, I have no problem giving you my email so that you can put it and people can reach out to me with questions. Uh, if, if, the, if that would be okay. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I'll put it down in the description for sure, everyone. Sure, and, and I'll get that sent to you soon. But besides that, just Panda, thanks again for letting me come on and chat with you. I, I hope I hope you had as much fun as I did. Yeah, yeah, it was great, and I hope the viewers enjoyed it. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined. It was a pretty long discussion, but I think we we covered a lot of ground. So um, yeah, uh, my plan is to keep bringing in more guests. Uh, from all types of faith and hopefully an X X X XJW as well. Um, and yeah, we'll see. But uh, damn, thanks for being the first guest in our channel. That's That was awesome. Well, I'm happy to be here, Panda. Thanks again. Yeah, okay. Uh, and I'll put uh, all the links in the description below to anyone who is interested in, in watching more of SEC. And again, thank you, SEC, so much. And we'll see you next time, guys. Goodbye. See you.